just gone quarter to eight here on the program. Now, the South African National Blood Service, or SANBS, says that in a study of SARS-CoV-2, antibodies among blood donors shows that actual infections may exceed officially diagnosed infections by a factor of 10. In simple terms, that a lot more people have had COVID than the official figures show. The study was conducted in four provinces in partnership with the Western Cape Blood Service. To tell us more, we're joined now by Marianne Vermeulen, acting COO at the SANBS and the principal investigator of this current survey. Marianne, great to have you. Thanks very much for being with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Leanne, for having us. So please explain to us how the blood service um, uh, it, it comes to the calculation that the SARS-CoV-2 antibodies found among blood donors was higher than expected. Is that against the official figures that we get on a daily basis? Yes, yeah, so what we did, we tested, uh, we, we got informed consent from donors uh, on certain collection days throughout January. As, and we didn't inform them that, that we were doing the study at all, but when they came to donate, we then, um, we said to them, would you be willing to be part of the study? They, if they said yes, we took, so we, we used the residual sample from their normal testing and we, we tested their, their blood. Yeah. So we found then that we had, so we then, we took those numbers that we then detected as positive and we used the um, proportion of the of the, uh, the donors that we have in each of those provinces and we then um, compared that and did a weighted average through to the to the actual general population. So comparing the population of blood donors with that of, of the general population and made a weighted average. And, uh, and yes, then we found that we had around tenfold um, higher prevalence of antibodies than compared to the case counts that have been that are being reported on a daily basis so each we, of those four provinces which is quite it's quite alarming because i mean if you look at I, i'm busy looking at the corner of the screen it's just been taken away now but if we if we look at the COVID numbers as of today that have been reported in total since the beginning of the pandemic we're at like one million four hundred and ninety six thousand four hundred and thirty nine so i mean if we're talking tenfold we way over that mark i mean we're sitting more at um about 15, 20 million people is the estimate that have actually had COVID that have not been detected? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think I think it might even be higher than that. But yes, uh, definitely around about that. And I don't think I don't think it's necessarily alarming. I think it might actually be good news mm -hmm. for us as a country. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did read an article, and I think it was just something that came out from um, Adrian Gall. I, I'm sure you you saw that as well. He was chatting uh, on behalf of Discovery, and also just talking to the fact of saying that at least half of South Africa has had COVID, and we just obviously don't have those numbers. Which the good news is is that may maybe stop us from that third wave, that dreaded third wave, obviously with the vaccines coming up, but there is that fear of a third wave, even with the vaccines, because it is a slow process. But, you know, is that is that something we can read into this? I think we must be careful about what we read into it. So, um, if there's no, you know, these are viruses and viruses mutate, that's what they do so that they can actually survive. Um, so if there are no um, further mutations that specifically um, mutate in areas where the antibodies have problems in binding, then I think, yes, it is good news um, because then I think we will have some level of immunity and, and if more and more people have immunity either from natural exposure or from the vaccine, then, um, then we should have a smaller third wave. But we, uh, the reason I say we need to be careful is there is a, a, a very nice study being done in, in Manaus in Brazil where they had a very high seroprevalence, in fact, even higher than what we are finding around about October last year. And uh, they thought that they were, you know, they hit herd immunity and they were fine and then had a huge second wave because their second variant, in fact, is very, very similar to our second variant, and it had this uh, mutation on the 484 gene, and that um, stops the binding working properly of the antibodies, and then um, so yeah. they so the immunity was not actually there. Yeah. So I think we need to be careful. I think we still have to make sure that we do everything that we're supposed to do. We wear a mask, we social distance, do all of those things because we just don't know what the virus is going to do. We certainly don't. And of course, with this new strain that we have here in South Africa, that is 
is worrying. It is very, very worrying. I mean, the 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 uh, 501Y dot V2 strain. Uh, you know, it's one thing perhaps having had the 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 first uh, COVID that came through and you've been infected, but I suppose it's trying to see if or how this kind of stops you from actually getting reinfected to and and to 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 what severity if you do get this new strain and that's that's obviously something we have to keep in our mind very 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 forefront of our mind absolutely absolutely yeah. so you use a term in in all of this called uh seroprevalence i hope i'm pronouncing it right and from my understanding seroprevalence is a is a number of persons in a population who test positive for a specific disease based on serology Please, can you explain that to us? Perhaps maybe you can put that in a simpler term. Okay, so, so yes, yeah, so, um, so the CRO stands for serology, so it is a serology test. And the difference between a serology test and a molecular test, molecular test, you're actually testing for the actual virus, the, the parts of the virus, so the RNA or the DNA. And with a serology test, you are testing for antigens or antibodies. So in this particular case, we're testing for the antibodies. So that is your own immune system um, that has responded to the virus. So it's not that we're not testing for the virus at all. We're testing for your immune response actually to that. So um, seroprevalence is the proportion of people who have, in, in this case, antibodies um, to, to the virus, SARS-CoV-2. Mm. Let's look a little bit more at the study now because it, it, it is very, very important. And I mean, to have something like this is, is golden. Uh, from what I'm reading, to have this kind of information is, is a good thing. Even though this was only done over a sample of 4,800 donors. So I suppose the first question is, is, how is it possible to conclude that we obviously did have higher from such a small study group? How do we calculate this versus what the results have actually showed? So you're correct. I mean, it is a, it is small in comparison to the number of people that there are actually in the in the in the province, and that's how most research is done. So you don't test every single person. So you test a sample set, and it's all about how how representative is that sample of the population that you want to make those various inferences about. Um, so so 4,800 is relatively small. It is. Although it, I say that, but it's also one of the largest seroprevalence studies that we currently have in this country. Mm. Um, I think the, um, the, other, the other relatively big one was the one in the Western Cape um, on pregnant women. And that, again, also showed similar prevalences, actually, to what we are finding, which is which also good news and helps to sort of uh, confirm the two results. Um, but so the donor population is not fully representative of the um, the general population. We uh, we we currently have equal proportions of um, of white and black donors, um, and they in, in our study population they made up each 40% of the study population. So up to 80% of the population was um, white and black. Um, and that's sort of representative of the of the general population, but it's but the but the whites are definitely overrepresented, and the and, and black donors are underrepresented. So we did a weighting a weighted average to compare to the gen to the general population. So it does have some um, um, some confidence intervals or some er error error bars, um, and um, so there's quite a wide range, but even so with that wide range, we're still looking at between sort of 55 and 65%. Mm. percent. Ma Marianne, talk to us about race. I mean, you mentioned this because this is something that is highlighted in this particular uh, study, the, the, the difference in infection rates or with, with regard to some of the things that are found between races. I know that you talk to blacks, whites, Indians. Y you've actually classed it this way as well. Uh, tell us firstly why and secondly, what are the findings? So, um, with most epidemiology kind of studies, you you look to see if you can find any associations in, in, in the various demographic or variables that you have in your study. So, we looked at, um, at province, we looked at age, we looked at gender, and we looked at race. Uh, we, we found no difference in, so we do report it in the paper, but we found no difference in, um, in age or gender. And um, that's why it's not really in any of the press releases. There was, there was no difference between the two of those. Oh, and we also looked at blood group, sorry, and we found no difference in blood group as well. Um, we did find a, a difference in, by province, and we found a difference by, by race group. So we reported what we found. Um, but I don't, there's no biological um, reason for having any difference in race. So we, we don't know um, 
what it necessarily means. What we do know is that there's no evidence internationally or locally that suggests that a specific race group is more susceptible to COVID-19. Um, there, however, has been strong evidence um, that inability to social distance and to adhere to the COVID preventative measures, or non-pharmaceutical measures that can be associated, well, is associated with high COVID transmission. Mm. Um, so why we are seeing these differences in our donors isn't actually clear, and this will need further investigation um, to look to see um, what it is, wh why that is. And, and that goes beyond um, our expertise, actually. So we will be collaborating, or we have already collaborated with Sasima from Stellenbosch University, and we'll continue to collaborate with them and others to try and determine, you know, what... Yeah what the reasons are for this. Fascinating findings, it really is. And I do hope that, you know, more, more is found on that. But just in terms of the provinces, I, sorry, we're going to run into time constraints. I just need to do this quickly. The Eastern Cape was the one that sort of came out with a much um, higher prevalence. I know you only did four provinces, but that Eastern Cape one uh, did set alarm bells going. But I know that there's been a lot of talk of the underreporting in the Eastern Cape, even to the point of the underreporting of the death because deaths here in South Africa, I mean, we've got sitting at um, excess deaths, 137,731, according to the, the South African Medical Research Council. But in, uh, in the Eastern Cape specifically, there could be reports of one in 300 people in the Eastern Cape actually dying from COVID. I mean, what are your results saying about the Eastern Cape? I, um, I think they're saying two things. I think they are so the excess deaths, as you as you rightly saw, and I think that say is, and I think that's also what Adrian Gore was uh, alluding to, is or not alluding to, but using that information to say that's why 50% of the population probably already have COVID. Um, I think uh, the the reason why we're seeing these big differences is because I think there is. Um, a high asymptomatic rate, and that's obviously good news for the country. Um, I do also think that there's potentially that there's, there's lack of access to healthcare. So people either um, can't get to healthcare to be tested, or else they can't afford to be tested, and so don't go to don't go to be tested, or maybe are even scared to go and be tested because you know if you were negative, you might you might pick it up right there while you're being tested, mm. kind of thing. So I think um, so I think there's a whole lot of reasons why um, that people are not presenting to test um, and and maybe just think it's flu-like symptoms. I don't know. Yeah. But then, you know, and, and that's why we see this big, huge disparity of around 10, mm. 10 to 15 fold difference is because mm. not everyone is getting tested. Certainly. And it's not a cheap test. Let's not kid. I mean, it's about 850 rand a test. So not many people can actually afford right. that. Um, as I let you go, Marion, will this be ongoing? Because you don't have information from Gauteng, uh, the most populous province, and, and of course, the Western Cape as well. Will we see those soon? We hope so. Uh, the reason we did these four provinces was because the, the platform that we actually have in the laboratory that services those four provinces, um, the, the reagent for that platform was has been approved by the regulators of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the Western Cape and the Gauteng laboratories have a much higher throughput um, instrument, and we're waiting for that reagent to be approved. The minute that reagent is approved, we will do the testing in the Western Cape and also in the Gauteng province, and then we'll release those results immediately. All right, Marion, thanks for talking to us. Um, your gorgeous little dog is running behind you, so enjoy her or him. <laughs> Marion, thanks for being with us. Marion from Mullen from the SAMBS talking to us about the study, um, which indicates that SARS-CoV-2 antibodies among blood donors shows that the actual infections may exceed official numbers by a factor of 10, so 10 times higher than what we're reporting, if not more. We've seen a lot of pets over the last two days. Birds, dogs, remember the dog barking? Dog barking yesterday? <laughs> yeah, I know. Anyway, we've got to go. We'll see you tomorrow.